Uh, let's move on. If we can bring up uh, the, the slide deck, moving into the next session. So continuing the discussion, we heard in the last session about hydrogen production, some of the pathways, the progress, and some of the remaining challenges that we need to overcome. So moving down the value chain, if you will, uh, this session will focus on hydrogen storage and distribution, in particular focusing on infrastructure development and coordination. Uh, the order of speakers will be Gordon Salahar from Wolf Midstream, then Mark Suster from the Bureau of Economic Geology at UT Austin, and then Bob Ostreich from Chart uh, Industries. And each of you kindly briefly introduce yourself when you begin your presentation. And audience, uh, another reminder, please continue to put your questions in the Q&A box. We'll bring that into the fold of the discussion as time permits. So with that, and without further ado, Gordon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Baron. Uh, I'm going to talk today about my organization's experience in uh, CCS, carbon capture and storage, and a few considerations for applications in the hydrogen value chain. Uh, just as by way of introduction, Wolf Midstream uh, is the owner and operator of an industrial scale, multi-source anthropogenic CO2 distribution disposition pipeline and some related capture and compression infrastructure. Our operating facilities represent about $500 million of invested capital and an active commercial enterprise in CO2 disposition. It's called the Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. Um, so that's just where, where we're at. We're doing it as a business. The CO2 sources that we're, we're working with right now are notionally related to the hydrogen value chain, um, and they're, but they are not standard hydrogen plants. But they're related processes from oil upgrading and from ammonia, ammonia and fertilizer. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about CO2 recovery from SMR hydrogen plants. That's the natural gas uh, fired, typically natural gas fired hydrogen plants. Um, my first slide here shows there's two general options for CO2 removal from a typical steam methane reformer. And I'm using generic data from an engineering study, which is also referenced at the bottom of the slide. Um, what you'll see at location number one is in the middle of the hydrogen uh, production process chain, and it captures process byproduct CO2 from the middle of the process. And the second location uh, is at the tail end of the process where this this process derived CO2 is mixed with combustion CO2, which is produced from the natural gas fuel. Um, the key things to note, and I don't want to go through all the numbers here, but you get about 90% of the available CO2 with option two because you're getting both the fuel and the feedstock derived carbon, and that makes your SMR plant nearly emission free. With option one, you get only about 60% of the available CO2 because you're missing the fuel uh, combustion component. Um, but you note, I guess, that the, the, the thing to note here from the study and from how we've derived some work from it is the cost per ton is lower in the process option than when you get into the combustion. And uh, just with in this particular case, the concentrations are similar. But um, one of the key reasons that cost per ton is a little lower in the middle of the process than at the outlet is the pressure. And this is kind of important. Option two, like almost all the combustion related uh, occurrences of CO2 is very low pressure, essentially atmospheric pressure. Whereas option one is in the middle of the process as a certain amount of process pressure to start with. And the key thing about CO2 disposition and sequestration is a lot of compression is required. So when you look at the cost differences here um, between those two options, it's really that one is low pressure and one is high pressure. And that $25 a ton that you're seeing is, is a lot of that is compression. Again, because the concentrations are, are, are similar. So that's, that's sort of the general learning of kind of a rule of thumb about uh, carbon capture from hydrogen is it is material affected by that pressure along with purity and concentration, which in this case are very similar. One other little item to note on this is that the mass of the carbon dioxide is about five to eight times greater than the mass of the hydrogen that's produced from the SMR. And if you're locating new SMR plants and you're talking about CCS, you got to imagine your disposition mass is five to eight times as much as your product mass. So uh, it might have an effect on, you know, what, how you think about locating uh, SMR plants with respect to, are they proximate to CO2 disposition infrastructure or are they, are they proximate to hydrogen markets? And so it's a thought. 
Um, next slide, please. The next, uh, this is talking about some general uh, attributes of carbon capture and storage, and some of the speakers have already been over this. Uh, we've we've seen here that, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that our experience has taught us is there's a number of things that are useful to support sort of a CCS infrastructure in a region, and that's critical mass of supply, and that doesn't mean just one source. Ideally, it's clusters of sources. Um, you know, in, in our system, there's, they could be industrial, refining, chemicals, power generation, hydrogen. Uh, second is the geology, which again, uh, are part of Canada and in Western Canada, we have this as an oil producing area. Um, that could be depleted oil reservoirs or uh, the pore space could be in these in deep well aquifers and both of those are being used in Western Canada for, for long-term CO2 disposition. Of course, there's the pipeline infrastructure, item three, and regulatory framework is another one. Um, it doesn't get a lot of talk, but really the fact that there is a price on carbon and or the tax credits that you have in the United States under 45Q or value for the offsets are created or a way to monetize the carbon disposition in a clean fuel market, all that that is very important uh, in, in providing a foundation for uh, a CCS business. And the second part is this permitting, and this has also been mentioned for, and the oversight for gas injection into geological reservoirs. Going into jurisdictions where they, where that there's not a great regulatory framework or there's no existing framework um, is, is a bit, is gonna be a bit more of a challenge. Typically oil producing areas like Texas and Alberta, we have, uh, you know, there's a long established process for that. And of course, people have already mentioned the workforce and services. Next slide. I, going back to that, um, talking about the infrastructure, um, when people will say there is a lot of existing CO2 infrastructure right now, and generally what you're seeing in, in Texas, in, in a lot of cases, a few cases is some of that existing CO2 infrastructure is related to the oil industry and it's used in enhanced oil recovery. And it's sourcing, in a lot of cases, non-anthropogenic CO2 resources. And they're point-to-point -point systems looking at where the CO2 resource is and where the EOR reservoir is. So a lot of the CO2 infrastructure isn't necessarily widely usable for this, the emerging uh, hydrogen applications that we're talking about today. The ideal a pipeline infrastructure connects a critical mass of emitters and a variety of off-takers and sequestration options, of which oil, enhanced oil recovery can be one. Um, going into CO2 pipelines, everybody, every people are, because of the distance involved and obviously the controversial nature of pipelines, it's, it's imagined that one of the big barriers in carbon sequestration is the pipeline. Um, certainly it's, it's a big factor, but we'll get into that. Just a few facts I wanna uh, point out here on pipelines. CO2 is most efficiently transported in a high pressure dense phase. Uh, it's super critical and it's essentially a liquid. So uh, a 16 inch pipeline can, can uh, transport 36,000 tons a day hydraulically in this liquid phase. It, and, and that's why the pressure is so high because you have to really, the, the way to transport CO2 is at this high pressure where it turns into a, essentially a liquid. And uh, the, one of the side effects of this high pressure is that you require non-standard pipe thickness for a pipeline, CO2 pipeline. Generally, it is not efficient or feasible to repurpose old oil and gas pipelines for CO2. Uh, it doesn't generally work because of the thickness. A um, couple other points on pipelines. Um, pr most of you, might, and this might make sense intuitively, pipelines have a dramatic economy of scale with respect to diameter and capacity. And that is stated very simply as cost of a pipeline is proportional to the radius or diameter of the pipe that you're installing. And hydraulic capacity is proportional to the radius squared. So this creates a strong economic rationale to aggregate volume, CO2 volume, and put your pipeline where there are, in such a manner that there are clusters again of supply and clusters again of, of uh, demand or uh, disposition locations. Um, fourth point here, for given pipe diameter, um, there really isn't a lot of economy of scale in distance. I mean, once you're past five or 10 miles and you're getting into 50, 100, 300 miles, 
um, there isn't really much economy of scale for distance. Twice as long, twice as much of a toll or twice as much of a cost. Uh, some of the data that's out there on existing industrial scale CO2 pipelines um, that are in, you know, in operation right now, of which ours is just one. If I look at the pipelines that are 50 to 300 miles in length, you know, approximate rule of thumb for the transport cost. When you look at these diameter, you look at the thickness, you look at the economy of scale for capacity, all those things, you can end up coming around to about 10 or $20 a ton of carbon dioxide is the, is the CO2 cost. And I guess the last point I wanted to make on that was looking at CO2 pipeline infrastructure and you go back to the hydrogen plant, the capture costs that, that are estimated at 45 to $70 a ton are multiples higher than the transport cost. And so really it's the technology of integrating capture in the hydrogen plant that's a key factor uh, in CCS and the transport cost itself is usually not um, the main hurdle to uh, CCS from hydrogen. So that's sort of our experience in, in the commercial business of CCS and uh, what we're seeing with respect to hydrogen. Obviously uh, hydrogen uh, represents a great opportunity for uh, those of us in the CCS space and uh, looking forward to, uh, to uh, participating in that further. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Gordon. Mark, you are up next. If you can go to the next slide. Yes. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Mark Schuster. I'm Associate Director at the Bureau of Economic Geology here at uh, Pickle Research Center at uh, UT Austin. Um, my background is uh, energy industry. I was uh, in the energy industry for over 30 years prior to coming to UT about five years ago. Uh, I'm, I'm a geologist by training, uh, working predominantly in oil and gas. And let, let me just say a couple of words of, about the Bureau, given that it's been brought up in conversation. So the Bureau of Economic Geology is uh, the second largest uh, research unit at UT, and it is the, the oldest uh, research unit here. Uh, it really focuses on research, uh, looking at energy, uh, environment, and the economy. Uh, particularly with regards to energy economics, and it has uh, uh, decades, several decades of experience looking at uh, Texas geology, but also geology and more broadly, and sp uh, with specific focus on the subsurface, uh, looking at energy production, uh, subsurface uh, storage as well. Uh, CCS was just brought up in the, the previous talk, and uh, carbon storage is a, a key focus for us right now. But uh, lately, we've been also uh, very uh, interested in uh, the, the whole dilemma of uh, hydrogen and uh, you know how we can try to um, develop uh, hydrogen at scale. And as a key part of that consideration is looking at hydrogen storage, but not only hydrogen storage, thinking about uh, such concepts as uh, hydrogen uh, generation from the surf, uh, subsurface, and also looking at uh, the uh, development of uh, hydrogen market and uh, infrastructure. So with that, um, I want to talk about scale initially and uh, really set up the question, where, you know, why should we care about uh, geological storage? And uh, of doing that in the context of uh, a map that's shown there is the, the natural gas uh, infrastructure that currently exists in uh, lower 48. And, uh, um, you know, regardless of what we're envisioning the, the source of hydrogen to be, and uh, based on you know, previous discussions today, it's probably going to be a combination of green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, you know, uh, green coming from solar wind or uh, nuclear-based electrolysis, blue from uh, natural gas or, or even uh, coal gasification. But regardless, you know, we're, we potentially are talking about uh, very large volumes. And because hydrogen has about a third of the energy of natural gas uh, by volume, uh, we're talking about the, the need to store and transport even larger volume of, of gas than we currently are doing uh, for natural gas. Uh, so, so, you know, the, the good news uh, it was, has been mentioned, and if you look at that little inset map, we already have uh, storage facilities for hydrogen in Texas. 
Uh, there are three uh, operating facilities and uh, these uh, have been uh, active, uh, at least one of them for uh, several decades. And uh, th their primary use is only uses for uh, petrochemicals. However, it, it, they provide uh, ex experience base for us to consider how to uh, effectively scale up in terms of storage and, and uh, the implications thereof. Uh, and I, I say scale up uh, deliberately because if you look at the, the actual volume that's stored right now, or put it in terms of energy, uh, it's uh, roughly uh, 500 uh, gigawatt hours. Uh, it, it's still uh, small with regards to the potential for uh, energy market development in the US. And so, um, you know, let, let's talk just a little bit about what uh, the the gas market and infrastructure actually uh, comprises currently in the U.S. So right now, the uh, U.S. is consuming about 85 billion cubic feet of uh, natural gas per day. And that uh, entails uh, a pipeline of, of millions of miles of uh, gas pipelines. Uh, it has uh, 400 underground storage sites and with a, a capacity of uh, over uh, 4,000 billion cubic feet of uh, storage. So that's a lot. And you compare that with what we can currently have for hydrogen, that's about six BCF, means that even if we want to consider just a, a small market penetration for energy or other utilization for hydrogen, let's say a 10% level or 1% level, then we're going to need uh, a lot more of uh, storage to, to actually be developed. Uh, some of that could be repurposed uh, existing in natural gas storage, uh, but uh, potentially if we're uh, seeing growth, it could also mean uh, we need to add to the storage requirements. And, uh, and if for those that may not be familiar working with uh, uh, volume units, just uh, as a, a short go by, you know, think about a billion cubic feet is about 300 gigawatt hours uh, of energy equivalent. So it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot of energy. It's a, it's a lot of gas by volume, and uh, it predicates a, a lot of uh, uh, storage requirements. So a um, couple of points here, uh, just uh, for the the thought experiments we run. If, let's say if we have uh, a one percent uh, of the the current natural gas market, what does that mean in, in terms of storage? Well, that's about a hundred. BCF of uh, hydrogen storage. And if we're envisioning 10% of the, of the current uh, natural gas market, that's uh, close to 1,000 uh, BCF or 1 trillion cubic feet of uh, uh, hydrogen storage. So uh, it will require looking at multiple uh, options. And if we can go to the next slide. The, those options, and uh, Gordon just touched on a, a couple of those, but uh, include uh, the depleted oil and gas fields that are existent in uh, areas uh, across the U.S., as well as, as Canada, as Gordon mentioned. They also include uh, saline uh, aquifers and uh, reservoirs in uh, uh, deep saline uh, uh, areas. And as well as salt domes, and the salt domes are basically probably uh, the, the most proven for hydrogen uh, options that we have. And those, uh, the examples that I showed in the last slide for what is uh, currently being used are essentially these uh, dissolution caverns and uh, salt domes. So. Um, those are the collection of most viable. There, there are other opportunities for storage as well, but these are the ones that are viewed as most viable for the uh, US and, and as well as Canada. And uh, if you think about um, the geographic coverage, Texas is uh, extremely well endowed because uh, what's important for uh, salt uh, storage is where we have thick salt deposits, and that includes a large part of the, the Gulf Coast area. We also have, of course, uh, many areas of uh, oil and gas production uh, with many depleted uh, oil and gas fields that can be utilized for storage. 
And as I mentioned, uh, we have uh, saline aquifers as well. They're extending uh, across a large part of Texas. But it, it also is important to think about this in the total scope of the U.S. is where we might need storage to uh, uh, underpin uh, an infrastructure and, and economy for hydrogen uh, development. So if we go to the next slide. So the, uh, we know what the options are, and, and many of these proven uh, of the 400 uh, storage options that I mentioned, those include salt, they include the depleted uh, oil and gas reservoirs, as well as uh, saline aquifers. We know a lot about salt, as I mentioned, those are currently active right now in the Texas Gulf Coast, but they do have uh, limit geography. And uh, for our expansion of those as options, we need to do uh, further investigations and, and catalog where we might be able to expand uh, the, the potential for, for salt storage. For depleted oil and gas fields and saline aquifers, these are definitely proven for natural gas storage. Uh, they have a wider geographic distribution. But there are some basic questions for hydrogen that need to be assessed, including uh, doing some uh, simple uh, cost uh, life cycle analysis, as well as looking at this, uh, more basic scientific questions about the chemical reactions and the geomechanics with hydrogen versus uh, natural gas as being uh, the uh, medium that needs to be stored. And we would like to move forward and get some pilot studies uh, going so that we can actually uh, test uh, hydrogen in, in the, these particular reservoirs. Uh, so with that, I, I think you know we're well suited to make the step to uh, move to large scale uh, storage uh, of hydrogen and uh, underpin the infrastructure that uh, you know even for a partial uh, development of hydrogen market is going to be important. And uh, I you know I just want to uh, nod uh, Put a, a, a word of thanks out to colleagues at the, at the Bureau here for doing this kind of work. And this is an area that uh, we see is uh, extremely important for uh, development of uh, hydrogen uh, as, as it progresses. So with that, I'll, I'll stop. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, if we could move to the next slide. Next up in this session is Bob Osterreich from Chart Industries. Bob? Uh, thanks, Arun, and uh, thanks for uh, letting Chart participate in this uh, in this roundtable. I'm Bob Ostrek. I'm the uh, Vice President of Global Hydrogen uh, Technology and Equipment Sales for Chart, and uh, I've been with uh, Chart about five months. Prior to that, I was at uh, a, an industrial gas company building out uh, hydrogen infrastructure in California for light duty vehicles and developing supply chains um, to uh, to fit into those stations, high pressure uh, gaseous supply chains. So today I'm gonna talk about um, chart, who we are and uh, how we see the market evolving. And uh, and Texas is a great, is a great uh, 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 geography um, to talk about uh, storage from uh, liquid hydrogen storage to transportation and, and, and the benefits it provides. Uh, next slide, please. So Chart, we are a, a cryogenic equipment company. We engineer uh, equipment from uh, brazed aluminum heat exchangers, which are a very key component in any type of manufacturing of uh, cryogenic gas uh, that then goes into a cold box uh, technology to liquefy and, and uh, separate those gases. Uh, we also do pretreatment. Uh, we have uh, uh, fan technologies, and then uh, the middle row is really uh, storage uh, and vaporization technologies. So we manufacture what we call shop built tanks. Uh, those have been we've been doing that for over 50 years, and uh, and our CEO Jill Ivanko has, has said uh, over the last six months, uh, after 50 years, uh, people are starting to recognize charts. Uh, uh, product line in terms of hydrogen with all the activity uh, that we see today. Uh, so we can manufacture tanks up to 170,000 gallons uh, for storage and then up down to smaller, uh, what we call small bulk tanks. 
And then down on the bottom, um, we are, uh, we're a very active, uh, we're very active in LNG, and I'll talk about LNG in particular to how we see the, uh, the liquid hydrogen uh, market evolving. But we, uh, we're a, we've got a full suite of, uh, of technologies from liquefaction uh, to transportation uh, to the fueling of those, uh, those vehicles using LNG. And then as far as liquid hydrogen, we have the trailer manufacturing for that. Uh, and, and for LNG, I should mention, and I think uh, Al Bergender mentioned it in his, uh, in his talk, is we manufacture uh, onboard LNG storage tanks for, uh, uh, for heavy duty applications. And, uh, and that's a pretty, pretty big business for us. And, and, and we see that as another parallel for uh, liquid hydrogen. Uh, next slide, please, Ron. Um, we're located all over the world. We've got uh, an engineering and uh, chemicals office here in, uh, in uh, Houston, outside of Houston. Our headquarters are in Balgron. Our main manufacturing for our cryogenics is in, uh, for our tanks is in uh, New Prague, Minnesota. And we manufacture liquid hydrogen trailers down in, uh, in Theodore, Alabama. We've got manufacturing facilities all over the world and, and, and in the key geographies uh, that, that we see hydrogen uh, becoming uh, uh, and playing a key role like Europe, Asia, uh, and Australia. Next slide. So um, chart, we're, to, we're, we're, we're playing in between the molecule uh, uh, producer and the, uh, the end user. So uh, uh, we fit right in the middle. We don't want to produce the molecules. We do have some strategic partnerships with uh, uh, with some electrolyzer manufacturers, and that's really to uh, to allow us to integrate liquefaction to more of a dynamic type of a process uh, than we're uh, than we're used to seeing with the SMR technology and steady state processes. We have the uh, the, the liquid storage uh, uh, products. We have the trailers, and then we're uh, we also have uh, uh, some developments going on with liquid pumps and uh, and uh, liquid hydrogen stations for both heavy duty and light duty. So um, the way we see, and I mentioned LNG, we see liquid hydrogen uh, and the supply chains evolving there, similar to what we saw with LNG. And, uh, and and you see a lot more talk with uh, with the, the 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 guys in the LNG space talking about uh, doing similar things where you have a low cost uh, feedstock or you have a low cost resource and you can then liquefy that and transport that to the markets that need that uh, that product. So uh, when we look at Texas. And we see uh, the wind out in West Texas, and we say, yeah, we can. And I think uh, you know, storing it in uh, in uh, spent uh, depleted gas wells or in salt caverns is a is a great place to store it. But then, how do we get that product uh, to market? And uh, and so when we liquefy that product uh, and put it in uh, in trailers, we can put around 4,500 kilograms in that trailer, and we can pretty much take that uh, all over the country. So uh, you can imagine uh, uh, a, a, a nice synergy between West Texas, uh, maybe storage in salt caverns, liquefaction, and then bringing it to, uh, to uh, the parts of the uh, country uh, where, the, uh, where the hydrogen is needed in the, in the metropolitan areas or uh, in the California. Um, and and the uh, I guess the uh, the credit markets will uh, will drive where that product goes depending on you know the carbon intensity. The other thing we see is uh, and I think Al Al mentioned this as well, and several uh, have mentioned the the SMR uh, capacity or the traditional hydrogen uh, uh, production cap uh, that we have in the Gulf Coast. Uh, you can imagine that if. Uh, if the uh, if the uh, the electrification of transportation uh, continues on the path we expect it to, um, those those assets will be uh, uh, will be underutilized, and to uh, to plug in a uh, a carbon capture technology into uh, those production units, uh, drive down the uh, the carbon footprint. 
liquefy that product and then bring that uh, bring that into the state of Texas and any excess would be exported similar in the way LNG is exported to other countries. So uh, again, we see we, we see uh, a very, very similar uh, uh, pathways for, for, for uh, liquid hydrogen as we saw over the last uh, 15 years for LNG. The other, uh, and, and so you can imagine then using truck, you, using rail, uh, and 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 ships to uh, to take uh, to take liquid hydrogen uh, um, to uh, to other uh, continents and and countries and and I, you, you probably read some some articles about that activity going on in Australia and uh, and, and and elsewhere. Um, the other thing that liquid hydrogen allows you to do is once you have it in the liquid state, is it allows you to compress, pump, and compress that hydrogen in a more efficient manner, both on the capital side of things and the energy side. You can pump a lot more liquid hydrogen into a high pressure vaporizer and then get that expansion and be able to do a lot more volume versus a standard uh, gas compressor. So as we move to scale and heavy duty and, uh, and, and, and buses, those, uh, uh, those applications become very nice uh, targets for, uh, for liquid hydrogen. So with that, that's uh, that's what I uh, have to say. And again, Arun and uh, and UT Texas, we appreciate the opportunity to participate in this event. Great, thank you so much. We are running tight on time, but I'll, I'll pose two very quick questions. Hopefully, uh, one goes to Gordon. Uh, one of the questions is: Can the two carbon capture options that you mentioned, uh, options one and two, can can those go simultaneously, or what are the you know, capital implications of that. Um, no, you wouldn't do that because uh, if you do, number one, you've really taken because if you look at the chart, if you look at the figure, the gas recycles around. So if you do number one, you make number two smaller. So generally those are you would do one or the other, um, uh, not both. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. Thank you, Gordon. And the second one uh, also hopefully quickly is for you, Mark. Are all underground natural gas storage facilities also sufficient for storing hydrogen? And if not, what are the key uh, issues? Yes, uh, thanks, Rune. So uh, just briefly, uh, definitely salt carbons are you know proven and are being utilized for hydrogen storage, and, and those work. Um, the, we expect that the uh, both uh, depleted gas fields as well as uh, saline aquifers will work effectively for hydrogen. But uh, to be honest, uh, they haven't been tested. So uh, th those need to be trialed and tested and, and we need to do uh, some research to demonstrate that they can't be used. Great, thank you. Uh, and I know there's just so much more detail around this, uh, but thank you for keeping your responses short. Bob, I do have a question for you, but you know, we'll, we'll not take your response. I'll pose the question anyway. It, it, uh, I'd be very interested in learning how your non-hydrogen operations, you know, what are the economies of, we talk about economies of scale, but you know, I'm very interested in causing economies of scope here. You, you have done a lot of things which are non-hydrogen based, and now you are able to move in a lot of that experience and technology into the hydrogen space. So there's a lot of intersectoral learning that is happening, and we are not starting from uh, completely bottom up here. So, uh, you know, any quick reactions to that, Bob? Hey, what was the question again, Arun? That, you know, what are your you know, non-hydrogen operations? How have your decades of experience in that space, how do you jumpstart your hydrogen part of uh, what well, you Well, I think we've been, like I said, we've been involved in, in liquid hydrogen storage for uh, since the 60s, right? And, and, and liquefaction of helium and liquefaction of hydrogen, we did that in the 90s, right? So um, we've had that experience uh, we and, and then LNG became that that hot market right in the uh, in the in the mid 2000s and and LNG became a very uh, a very attractive product and that was kind of the stepping stone to clean combustion right and and so now we're seeing that liquid hydrogen and the quest for zero emission or electrification right I think that's the key difference here for most of what we're talking about we're talking about either electrification or transportation or we're talking about uh, industrial uses. Um, and, and I think what, what's key here is, is the, the, the liquefaction becomes that, that, um, uh, that state that allows you to bring it places, 
right? And we've done this. I mean, if you look at uh, many of the cryogenic tankers and tanks you see out there are probably chart tanks. Now the time is is here where we're seeing that growth in hydrogen before it was you know GDP growth or you'd have a hot market like uh, solar and they used uh, bulk hydrogen. But now we see the uh, uh, the world aligning in terms of uh, the quest for hydrogen. And until those pipelines get built, right? The, the, the pipelines are going to be other forms of, of transportation. It's going to be rail. It's going to be, you know, the, the trucks. It's going to be marine. And I think our experience in LNG, coupled with our experience in our ability to store liquid hydrogen in a, uh, in a cost-effective and efficient manner, meaning uh, you, know, you, you have designs and you have uh, insulation that doesn't allow the hydrogen to, uh, to escape, uh, gives us that springboard uh, to get us uh, into this uh, to this new growth mode that we're seeing. Great. So thank you so much, you all. Thank you, Gordon, Mark, and Bob. And I hope you will have time to stick around for the remainder of the meeting.